welcome to the third and final day of uh, this year's summer school. Um, we're happy everyone uh, could participate either in line or in person. And I hope everyone thoroughly enjoyed it so far. Um, today, we'll start off by a lecture from Katerina Kolosova, um, which is very exciting for everyone. Um, Kolosova uh, is a senior researcher and full professor at the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities, Skopje. Um, at the Institute, she teaches policy studies, political philosophy, and gender studies. She is also a professor of philosophy of law at the Doctoral School of the University American College, Skopje. At the Faculty of Media and Communications, Belgrade, she teaches contemporary political philosophy. She was a visiting scholar at the Department of Rhetoric at the University of California, Berkeley in 2009 under the peer supervision of Judith Butler. She was a member of the board of the directors of the New Center for Research and Practice, Seattle, Washington. She is also the first co-director and founder of the Regional Network for Gender and Women's Studies in Southeast Europe. Her most recent monograph is Capitalism's Holocaust of Animals, a non-Marxist critique of capital philosophy and patriarchy published by Bloomsbury in 2019, whereas Cut of the Real, Subjectivity and Post-Structuralist Philosophy published by Columbia in 2014 remains her most cited book. Um, so I'd also like to just quickly thank uh, Katerina for everything she did on behalf of all of the participants um, for allowing uh, this event to happen. So if you're ready to start. Okay, so uh, we will uh, revisit some of the themes uh, discussed here uh, in the previous days, uh, some uh, topics uh, uh, and some authors were uh, referred to uh, not just in the presentations of the keynote speakers, but also in the presentations and the discussions of the other participants. Uh, we will revisit the um, Laruel's non-philosophy. Uh, we will uh, revisit my attempt to marry Laruel La with um, the texts of Karl Marx and how the, uh, this marriage, this uh, uh, fusion of the two methods can uh, play out uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, feminism, but also uh, in certain uh, new philosophy or new political philosopher or epistemology for a new uh, uh, political philosophy that will um, shift uh, the positions of the concepts of the subjectivity uh, of subjectivity and uh, the objects uh, revisit uh, 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 Marx's notion of objectivity, which, as I said in the previous days, has nothing to do with uh, the positivist uh, notion of objectivity. It's a quite interesting perspective, actually. Uh, and by doing so, doing so, we will see if this bringing closer of uh, philosophy and science, um, of course, not the established uh, scientific disciplines, uh, but uh, more the scientific uh, posture of thought, uh, the, the scientific uh, habitus, the, 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 the uh, um, let's say, metaphysical positioning of science, its treatment uh, of the real. Uh, I'm um, improvising with the terminology here now. Uh, uh, so uh, in that sense, a creation of a science uh, that is Marxist, that is uh, in, in line with Laurel's treatment of philosophy from a scientific point of view. So in this, in this said, uh, um, so, uh, so sense of the word science. Um, also bringing it together to, uh, closer together to some of the sciences actually, uh, some of the existing sciences. So an attempt to establish a dialogue uh, with the sciences, uh, a dialogue that is um, 
uh, uh, established on a certain plane of a, uh, let's say, flat ontology, although I have a problem with the notion of uh, ontology, but let's use it uh, uh, in this context to simplify the, the, the introduction. Uh, although it may render things more complex than simplify them, maybe just reading the text would uh, make things simpler. So anyway, uh, I'll, I'll uh, wrap up with this. Uh, so a dialogue between philosophy and science in a way uh, that does not permit uh, philosophy to assume this uh, meta position, this position of superiority uh, or meta, simply meta, and comment uh, uh, with its own, within its own terms, with its own means, what happens uh, in science and how, uh, how it might reflect back upon philosophy. And through that, uh, on, um, on society, on the possibility of reconceptualize society um, in the light of uh, the more recent development in sciences and in particular uh, 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 technology. So uh, all of this uh, has been somehow uh, in a way touched upon in the previous talks uh, by the others, uh, not just through my comments. Um, revisiting it now through my perspective. As I said, this will be a combination of uh, Laruel applied on Marx. That means uh, uh, an addition to uh, Marx's own ambition to uh, render his thought scientific. Uh, as you all might, might remember, Marx's goal was to move away as much as possible from philosophy and establish a certain science of political economy, a science that establishes the uh, species being of humanity, that is, uh, explains um, uh, society uh, by way of moving away further and further from philosophy. Uh, that is mainly his... Uh, um, essentially his disagreement with Hegel all along, uh, if you remember from his text. So to this, I'm adding uh, uh, through a, a sort of a, a procedure of superposition, uh, miming the, the, the position of superposition, I'm adding the method of non-philosophy, Francois Laruel's non-philosophy. I would treat Laruel's role here as purely uh, formal, purely methodological, one that provides, provides the conceptual means to identify uh, uh, the tenets of philosophy that remain in Marx's own text, although I myself have not spotted them. I, I, uh, I, I have spotted a constant uh, tendency of, uh, in Marx to move away from philosophy. Uh, it helps, uh, I would say, it helps to uh, spot uh, the tenets of uh, philosophy, res residuals of a philosophical stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Marx uh, um, uh, uh, in uh, the uh, the legacy of Marxism, not so much in Marx uh, himself. So that explains why I do away with much of the further legacy uh, um, of uh, Marxism. Why approach? Uh, why uh, why I approach Marx's text directly through uh, Laurel or sometimes simply directly, uh, I don't need uh, or I do not resort to mediation. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, sometimes I make uh, um, a re uh, uh, recourse to uh, a zone rattles epistemology that I consider more uh, truthful rendition of what Marx is about epistemologically. So uh, 
this long intro, even though it might be confusing, uh, 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 instead of helping, might help introduce the notion of non-Marxism. I mean, uh, there is uh, so often this uh, misunderstanding uh, between us, the non-Marxists or non-standard Marxists and the other Marxists uh, that take uh, uh, the word literally and uh, completely misunderstand its meaning, thinking that it's something anti-Marxist, uh, something that has nothing to do with Marx. No, non-Marxism is simply short for non-philosophical Marxism or uh, uh, philosophically non-standard uh, Marxism, uh, that is Laruelian uh, approach to, to Marx and Marxist text. Um, so the word non-Marxism is used in, in, in that sense. You can put it under the uh, wider category of post-Marxisms, uh, let's say, although I do consider it a kind of a radical Marxism or one with um, with many consonances with the orthodox uh, Marxism. Uh, orthodox meaning prior to Lenin. Uh, uh, okay, so I'll start now. If it's too long, just stop me. Uh, I'll read a paper that's not published, but uh, so it, it should be soon published. Uh, I Okay, I, I don't want to ad advertise it. I will give you the information further on. Uh, anyway, this is uh, just a draft now, uh, a preprint. So, so the scope of the paper I'm presenting the, the, uh, is the following. Um, to present the concept of the radical diet of the non-human, the non-human is again understood in this Laruelian non-philosophical sense. So human without philosophical humanism. The word for that we are using here is no, uh, the non-human. So uh, the goal is to present the concept of the radical diet of the non-human and attempt to think radical humanity in terms of Marxian materialism, uh, that is the product of approaching Karl Marx's writings on the real and the physical. These are his words. Uh, I would like to uh, underscore that he resorts far more often, as you may have noticed yourselves in his own texts, to the words, uh, the real and the physical, rather than the material perhaps because he had to problematize uh, Feuerbach and the materialism of his era as you know, too philosophical and he saw a problem there. So uh, he seems to prefer these two words. Uh, so we are examining this radical humanity which goes beyond uh, uh, philosophical humanism and actually does away completely with the concept of the human in the philosophical sense and its centrality uh, to our organization of thought, uh, philosophical or scientific. So this metaphysical core uh, around which we all kind of position ourselves regardless of whether we're in science or in philosophy or arts. Uh, it is kind of a metaphysical organizing uh, principle, uh, the relation we assume toward the human and its possible centrality to our thought. Um, so uh, we're revisiting the uh, 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 the human and advocating for uh, a radical uh, humanism in in that sense, uh, in a sense that has already done away with the centrality of the the human uh, as um, as a remainder of a philosophy within uh, Marx, um, as pointed out by Marx himself. Um, okay, so 
uh, I'll continue uh, without further digressions. So unlike post-humanism inspired by critical theory and the method of post-structuralism, the theory of the non-human as a radical diet of technology in the generic sense of the word, ranging from techne, the Greek techne, uh, which means skill, craft, of speaking a natural language, or using a tool, to AI technology. All of this is generically put te techne, uh, or uh, it's more a, con a contemporary variant uh, technology, Some, something to do with technology. So the theory of the non-human as a radical diet of technology in the generic sense of the word, ranging from techne uh, or the techne of speaking a natural uh, language to AI technology and the organic understood as physicality does, uh, does away, as I said previously, with anthropocentrism. Moreover, it does away with anthropomorphology of thought. So it seeks to um, uh, step away from anthropomor uh, anthropomorphic thought, because uh, I will explain what it is, uh, but uh, I, I'm assuming it's clear. Uh, anthropos is the organizing principle of thought. So moreover, t it does away with anthropomorphology of thought, inalienable from any uh, theorizing uh, or philosophy that is centered on the notion of human subjectivity. So any philosophy that is centered, uh, centered on the notion of human subjectivity is inevitably anthropomorphic. So subjectivity as the organizing pr principle of thought renders uh, any kind of thought as anthropomorphic. Uh, it could be a thought of science from within science, but non, not necessarily scientific, um, or it could be a philosophy. Uh, so it does away with an, uh, uh, anthropomorphology of thought, inalienable from any theorizing or philosophy that is centered on the notion of subjectivity which is human subjectivity, or to borrow a Laruelian term, any posture of thought that is modeled according to the structure of subjectivity-centered thinking, even if the semantics may differ. differ. The problem is the structure of subjectivity-centered thinking. Marx also operates with the notion of the real, oftentimes simultaneously with that of the physical. He uses them as if almost um, uh, uh, synonyms. I have approached the concept found in Marx by means of Laurel's suspension of the principle of philosophical su sufficiency. That is by way of exiting the vicious circle of philosophy, legitimizing philosophy. And in that process, positing and creating the real as existent, non-existent, relevant, irrelevant, as well as what is real and what is an illusion. So uh, uh, all, uh, all of this uh, ranges of, uh, of uh, the notion, uh, recreating uh, the real, like, you know, in the way we spoke yesterday, philosophy not just decides what's real, but kind of legislates what's real. And Laurel sees a problem in the structure of philosophy itself as such. It cannot resist, resist because it's within its stru stru structural composition, uh, a result of its intrinsic laws to not just uh, decide, um, argue what the real is, uh, uh, not just stipulate uh, or postulate, but uh, simply legislate what's real. And uh, that's why we have that practically metaphysical mm, confrontation yesterday. What is real? Is gender real? Is sex real? Uh, so this is a product of, a pro a product of uh, essentially philosophical uh, uh, thinking or uh, as Zonretel calls, calls it, traditional philosophical theorizing. Uh, 
to legislate what's real. No, we, uh, by moving away from philosophy and its problem of uh, philosophical sufficiency, uh, we are moving uh, away from this tendency while keeping some of the conceptual material uh, that philosophy provides from us, for, for us, I'm sorry. So this is uh, um, uh, what Laurel does. With this, uh, this is what uh, uh, Laurel is essentially about. And um, his notion of, uh, and his uh, equation between uh, the one and the real that has oftentimes been uh, mystified um, and treated uh, sometimes almost, uh, I don't know, theologically, even though he, he does have a, his own version of theology as well, uh, uh, has in fact a, a very practical uh, function or very specific function uh, that renders this kind of thinking scientific. And I will move toward uh, that part which explains how come. Um, uh, okay, so I had to make this digression so that the this uh, uh, problem of principle of uh, philosophical sufficiency and how it's applied on the reading of Marx is better explained and that uh, all of you can follow. So I have elaborated that uh, proposal at more detail elsewhere. That is my latest book, that uh, the Holocaust of the Animals, uh, that uh, Zach mentioned in the introduction, uh, which is, as I explained um, you know, on the pr first day, not actually about animals or just about animals. It's about the treatment of physicality, anim including animality. Uh, but other forms of uh, physicality or physical reality that do not have to be, uh, you know, uh, living uh, creatures, do not have to uh, represent life. So it's not vitalism. I told you we can, we can uh, re use this the term, term in the sense of, I don't know, the objects, uh, but uh, not as commodities but in their sense of use value. So, uh, so uh, all of this is uh, elaborated in uh, that book and uh, I won't go further into uh, you know, uh, proposing a, a backdrop of uh, this reading, but I guess these interventions were necessary, necessary in order to follow the argument. Uh, so uh, all of this is an attempt uh, that is um, a, uh, with Laurel, with uh, uh, Marx, uh, with, uh, that is aided with the uh, feminist philosophy of Luce Irigaray and um, John uh, Omolarkis, or Omolarkis uh, reworking of Laurel's uh, human in human as the non-human. Um, so Laurel, not unlike Marx, argues that the thought that seeks to transcend the circularity of philosophy needs to submit to the real. But in order to do so, it must abolish the very possibility of relationality between the two. Thus, one avoids the error of amphibology, as he call it, calls it, of substituting through truth for the real and the other way around. Arriving at a unity of the two, this is what philosophy does, uh, substituting tr truth for the real and the other way around, arriving at a unity of the two, whereby what is real must also be true and the other way around. The post-philosophical or non-philosophical thought must mime the scientific posture of thought, whereby the thought submits to the always already foreclosed real, but the ontological foreclosure does not prevent the thought from seeking to clone, as uh, Laruel would put it, to clone the, the real. The real is not a substance. That, that, uh, it's a, uh, how did you put it, Maria, yesterday? An operational category. 
it's not substance. Uh, it is an ontological modifier or rather an epistemic category. It is in this sense that it is also the one. So in this sense, it's the one. Um, I will explain how come. Uh, why, if it's uh, uh, merely an epistemic, uh, epistemic category, it has to be the one. Uh, the unilaterally posited elements of the diet, so physiology and uh, techne, technology, language, etc. on the other side, uh, the unilaterally posited elements of the diet lead to the latter mechanically uh, producing sense. Uh, the point is the following. The diet is radical because technology, uh, which includes, as I said, language, uh, lang language enables subjectivization, participation in, the, you know, in discourse, the world, whatever. Uh, so on the other side, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, language. On the other hand, we have uh, the real, the physical, etc. So, what uh, Laurel uh, would call the radical diet is uh, the diet between thought and the real. To him, it's a uh, epistemological uh, thing. Uh, his point is that the real always evades, uh, is always already foreclosed. The uh, uh, thought, he uses the term thought, to avoid uh, subject or subjectivity. Thought seeks to explain the real. Uh, and this relation is unilateral because the real is, you know, prelingual. The real does not possess language. The real does not uh, enter into dialogue with, uh, you know, with thought. It's simply, you know, this dumb, numb, real. Uh, indifferent uh, real. So it, uh, he repositions the relation between thought and the real in this way. And in that way, he mimes the, uh, the way uh, science treats the real. So what I have done with uh, radicalizing the post-structuralist actually concept, uh, post-humanist concept of the human by way of grounding it into uh, Marxist uh, ontology and methodolo methodology, adding to it uh, Laruel's uh, approach to Marx or any uh, philosophy, uh, I have further radicalized uh, the concept of hybridity or the cyborg that is the grounding idea of post-humanism so if donna haraway and cyber feminism uh, tells us that we are this hybrid uh, of uh, technology and organicity the or the organic as donna haraway puts it she also calls it Calls, calls it the animal uh, within us, you know, the animal we are. So she, uh, she refers, if you remember the manifesto, she very often refers to, uh, you know, uh, us as a combination of animals and technology. So if we uh, accept this uh, uh, proposition of um, the post uh, humanism, and if we, as I said, and, and I do accept it, uh, and if we ground it in Marxism and add uh, Laurel's non-philosophical approach, we could dismantle with this totality. So this um, diet of technology and the physical 
uh, does not represent any sort of unity. It does not seek any kind of unity uh, or um, seeks ways to represent itself uh, a, 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 as any sort of unity. Uh, now, why do I need uh, Laurel in this? Uh, you, uh, one might ask because Haraway herself insisted that it's a hybrid so uh, there is no unification yes but uh, there has been a kind of a conclusion uh, among the commentators of Haraway I don't think I see it in her own texts that this is a paradox so this is a unity of a paradox this is a paradoxical unity but there must be some kind of unity and this uh, kind of unity represents the truth of what we are. So the truth is that we are this hybrid. Uh, and so it must become, uh, and because it's the truth, it's also the real and the other way around. And we're expected to act according to this ontological, the uh, I don't know decree. This is we are this. So uh, it uh, due to what Laurel calls philosophical spontaneity, it becomes once again a unity. Uh, this paradoxical unity, and the commentators have once again philosophic in a philosophically spontaneous way uh, interpreted this unity. Uh, in a sense that has oftentimes been uh, opposed by Haraway herself, but uh, obviously no one cares. The uh, commentarism continues uh, without paying regard to uh, her constant explanations that this uh, hybrid does not imply any superiority of the technical over the physical or the animal. There is no hierarchy there. Uh, my uh, use of Marx here uh, and uh, Laurel helps <clears throat> ground her argument uh, in uh, Marxist materialism in order and then uh, uh, fortifies this uh, grounding uh, with Laurel's non-philosophy in order to evade uh, this sp philosophically spontaneous uh, establishing uh, of unity assumption of there being some uh, unity, even in the form of a paradox. Um, this nothingness out of which we draw a certain content or definition of ourselves or uh, whatever. Uh, no, we affirm the, uh, the radicality uh, and the impossibility to reconcile the two elements. So uh, the way uh, the diet of thought and the real, similarly, not, uh, not very much unlike uh, in Lacan, uh, are foreclosed to uh, one another. So in that sense, the physical within ourselves, the, the, the material within ourselves, uh, ourselves, that is according to the, uh, the not do orthodoxy, let's say of post-structuralism, something that belongs to the realm of the real and we have nothing to say of the real because this is what Lacan teaches us, allegedly. Uh, that's how it's explained in Bodies That Matter by Judith Butler. Uh, body, the body becomes irrelevant. We do not say anything of it because it's prelingual. It does not participate in language, in the production of science, in the signifying automaton, that language, whether natural, whether artificial, regardless, all of this is uh, a language. 
sign production is meaning production meaning uh, uh, me in its essence it's it's uh, nothing else uh, but that so according to the post structuralist uh, orthodoxy this is what makes sense this is what speaks to us this is uh, uh, where we can construe meaning whereas the real is uh following the doc doctrine of uh lacan in in my view in a in an uh erroneous way uh following the do doctrine of lacan uh, we simply uh, uh, uh establish that it's uh, the uh, uh, the physical does not participate in language in sign making therefore it belongs to the realm of the real therefore we simply the um do away with its relevance for our discussion and now everything is the uh, product of sign of sign making so the real is left uh, there as it's supposed to be allegedly because it cannot participate in uh, in, lang in language making, in sign making, uh, it's not part of the signifying automaton. Uh, therefore, it's put aside and rendered irrelevant, and in fact, inexistent. So, this is the the interesting conclusion. Uh, so, this again is the product of this reflex uh, reflex reflex of um, philosophical spontaneity as uh, literal would put it because it belongs to uh the real and we cannot produce truths of it because the real is outside of language it does not exist so what exists is sign making meaning ma making um language therefore this discourse discursive construction etc this is the only possible ontology why is it so because uh there we can produce truths uh the the real does not help us constitute truths and truth is obviously taken in the uh, in the philosophical sense of the word what is truthful or what is the truth or the ontological truth is also real and what is real is true this is the the you know the beginning the origin of all philosophy since the the beginnings of greek uh, philosophy and it's still dragging on and one of the reasons why we cannot communicate with the sciences, even we uh, when we have something to say, uh, is precisely this reflex. And uh, when sciences seek to establish a certain project uh, that is of societal, historical, or whatever relevance, the sciences also follow this philosophical spontaneity so they find themselves trapped within the same um, uh, uh, metaphysical error therefore i argue it's perhaps more use useful uh, or it makes more sense if it's more productive to admit that we cannot avoid being moved in our reflection in our inventions so including technological invention uh, by metaphysics uh, uh, but uh, because it that is what moves us we we want to establish a certain relation to uh, the exteriority we want to uh, um, know what's real and what's not we want to control it uh, etc so we want to reshape it by reshaping it we want to understand um what our limits are etc all these questions are in fact not philosophical these questions are metaphysical the approach to this question uh that 
the legislates uh, realizations, conclusions, cognitive products, um, uh, the f truths as, you know, legislating reality, that's an impulse that we must uh, evade in order to pursue a scientific uh, uh, type of thought. So, um, I may be running out of time. I don't know how much time I have. Okay, so I'll skip this other uh, parts and uh, quickly go through this thing. Um, it's more... Uh, uh, this problem of uh, subjectivity centered uh, thought is kind of implied uh, here. Uh, it's not elaborated in detail, but if I go to, to that question directly, I will uh, uh, lose the opportunity to explain, uh, to give an, a, a materialist uh, account of both uh, physicality and sign making and how they uh, relate uh, or the signifying automaton and how they relate to one another. So this part is called doing away with the, uh, uh, and mind you, I didn't read anything. I, uh, it was all intros, intros, intros and digressions. <laughs> Never mind it. Uh, I thought it was uh, kind of made more sen sense after all of the previous discussion. Uh, so I'll just uh, read this part now. It might give more coherence to what I kept explaining until this moment. So doing away with human and nature. So doing away with human and nature as philosophems in order to arrive at radical humanity. Animality the physical and materialist account of intelligence and signification. If one seeks to circumvent the ultimately humanist dream of transhumanism, uh, one needs to epistemologically reposition uh, assuming what Marx would call the third party's view. So this is... Uh, the doing away with subjectivity centered uh, thought I was talking about. We must assume the third party's view. The perspective of a third party is objective insofar as objective, uh, insofar as it mimes the position of the surrounding objects, including the human subjects externalized actions externalized actions, mind you, as objective realities, objectivities or objects, if you will. It is not a positivist stance regarding objectivity because the human species being, as Marx calls it, is entangled in the sensuous and the physical, also Marx's words, whereas Social relations are real abstractions, to quote the Marxist epistemologist Alfred von Zon uh, Rettel. Therefore, an absolutely autonomous self detached from its own and the surrounding materiality, the world, social relations and nature, ascending to a mind of pure science governed by objective truths uh, from a Marxist point of view, or Marxist point, uh, uh, from uh, a Marxist point of view is uh, impossible. So the phantasm of positivism is such that it is, uh, that it is automatically precluded, rendered impossible from the viewpoint of any Marxian uh, epistemology. Marxist third party's, uh, view, party's view based on objectivity requires that the thinking subject, subject treats itself as an object as well to assume an imagined third party's posture of thought. So this soloquy of uh, the philosophical self, the, the cogito is abolished. And, uh, and mind you, this is not uh, 
OOO either because OOO uh, actually uh, produces a concept of object whereby the object mimes the subject, which is uh, quite the opposite to what I'm saying here. So the third party uh, perspective is situated beyond the subject object binary by way of postulating subjectivity as an object among objects marx does not erase subjectivity does not discard it as an agency carrying out the activity or thought uh, of thought instead he suggests that the subject mimes the structure and the status of exteriority of the object than the other way around it is precisely the subject-centered thought that, is, that defines uh, philosophy and precludes it from becoming a truly materialist science. That is why Hegel's dialectics structurally fails, uh, says Marx in his critique of Hegel's philosophy in general. There he says, whenever real corporal man, men, with his feet firmly on the solid ground, man ex exhaling and inhaling all the forces of nature, posits his real objective essential powers as alien objects like labor power. By his externalization, it is not the act of positing, which is the subject in the process, it is the subjectivity of objective essential powers whose action therefore must also be something objective. An objective being acts objectively and he would not act objectively if the objective did not reside in the very nature of his being. He only creates or posits objects because he is posited by objects because at bottom he is nature in the act of positing therefore this objective being does not fall from his state of pure activity into a creating of the object on the contrary his objective product only confirms his objective activity his activity as the activity of an objective natural being or put differently to be objective, natural, and sensuous, and at the same time to have object, nature, and sense outside oneself, or oneself to be object, nature, and sense for a third party is one and the same thing from the same text. Uh, nature is the same abstraction as anthropos that needs, uh, uh, end of quote, uh, this is me now talking. Nature is the same abstraction, uh, philosophical abstraction, but, or it can be a social abstraction or scientific, it doesn't matter, it's an abstraction, as anthropos. Uh, that in its philosophical sense needs to be unraveled by arriving at, at its material or concrete components, as Marx would put it. Only to yield the abstractions that define and explain it by way, by way of being concepts, notions uh, produced by a third party. We will have to resort to Laurel's method of dissembling the conceptual unity, the abstractions that Marx problematizes, uh, abst abstractions insofar as generalizations, not the abstractions that he creates when he departs from uh, the concrete. So, or a notion, uh, uh, this, uh, disassembling a conceptual unity, so the abstractions that Marx problematizes, or a notion that is the product of the principle of philosophical uh, sufficiency, such as nature, in order to arrive at the concrete, or rather at the transcendental material constituting a hora, which is a disorganized topos of concepts, undergirded by the real, or the physical, as Marx would put it. By depleting nature of the, enlighten, of the enlightenment and modern philosophy from the binding conditions of the principle of philosophical sufficiencies, uh, from the classical binaries, such as nature, culture, or technology, body, mind, animal, human, 
all these uh, uh, binaries are characteristic pertaining to the philosophical concept of the, the, the human uh, uh, and nature, uh, both, uh, we might be able to arrive at the concrete, as Marx would put it, and the determination in the last instance that are of the physical insofar as the real. As I said, not physical in the vital sense, physical could be a product of human labor as well, material in that sense. But I use physical because it's more truthful to Marx's uh, original text. Uh, so, by way of employing Laurel's method of unilateralization, that is fashioning a concept, product of thought that succumbs to the real and merely clones it or mimes it, we may be able to arrive at a determination in the last instance of the notion of nature. Uh, conceiving nature in the manner of Aristotelian miming, uh, Laroelian cloning, or Wittgenstein's Maßstab, because he talks also about kind of a cloning, you know, uh, scale applied to reality, if you remember from his Tractatus, we arrive at a concept that is not far from uh, the one that natural sciences operate with. It is, in the last instance, the organic that can be defined in a compatible, in compatible ways by the evolutionary biology, chemistry, neuros neurosciences, to name a few. <clears throat> in this way, so through the application of Laurel's method and Marx's uh, 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 ma uh, materialism, uh, through philosophy, we arrive at the same understanding of the uh, notion of the uh, of nature, uh, not same but compatible with that of the sciences. So we have to reduce the definition of it to the organic at least when, it, we, when we speak of the species being of humanity. And in that uh, uh, way, we are approaching the sciences. Um, in rare examples, we find nature underpinned by or uh, reducible to the organic, such as in Schelling and other philosophers, as interpreted by Yuk Hui in his recursivity and contingency, but also in some critical theorists and contemporaries like Donna Haraway. Uh, so, um, what Yuk Hui explains is basically that, there, that a similar ontology underpins both nature and technology. Uh, and in a way, even though working through uh, German idealism, he arrives at a materialist conclusion uh, uh, about uh, both realities, that of uh, production of uh, signification, language creation, the, trans trans the transcendental, uh, you know, the, the, the plane where thought takes, takes place and the physical or the material as two things underpinned uh, by the same um, uh, uh, ontology uh, that is in fact in the last uh, instance material. <clears throat> he identifies the movement of recursion <clears throat> or recursivity uh, uh, he institutes the notion of recursivity as an ontological principle, uh, which is a essentially mechanical procedure one uh, finds in computing to the interpretation of what happens in nature. And he, uh, through sharing, through ideology, he actually uh, comes to the conclusion that nature is governed uh, by a certain, uh, I, I don't know how to put it, a paradoxical form of uh, teleology, a teleology which does not uh, have a, a telos out, outside of that of um, maintaining 
itself and further perf perfecting itself. So his point is that the, the way computing uh, moves, uh, which is uh, um, on the principle of recursion, you know, uh, calculus moves away and then uh, returns to uh, integrate the error, the error contingency, so the accident into what makes sense, into a functional whole uh, that uh, he, he concludes that that also happens in nature. Uh, we can see here that there is a lot of similarity uh, between this uh, treatment, um, understanding of uh, uh, nature and uh, technology in a very similar way. Uh, and even though he does not uh, make a clearly materialistic uh, conclusion, uh, obviously uh, the inference is a materialist one, um, uh, in spite of the, his path being uh, through uh, ontology, that these two things, technology, uh, uh, sense-making, so the signifying automaton and physiology nature are governed by the same organizing principle that is in its uh, core uh, material, as I said, because it's mechanical, as he puts it. Um, and here we're arriving to uh, the uh, yet another point which is important uh, about the real and the one and the position of uh, the notion of uh, the binary in uh, Larwell uh, in, um, in my own, own writing because we're talking about a dyad here even indirectly in uh, uh, post-structuralism uh, or one part of it, Donna Haraway's uh, concept of uh, the hybrid, uh, the cyber feminist uh, cyborg. So uh, if we apply this scientific treatment of philosophy that uh, Yuk Hui demonstrates, if we apply uh, Laurel's uh, treatment of philosophy um, stripped of um, that stance that makes it uh, self-sufficient and in fact uh, succeeds to uh, mime uh, um, <clears throat> the outside reality even though foreclosed, uh, if we agree uh, with Marx that uh, and zone rattle that everything is of the last instance somehow materially uh, determined, uh, then uh, this diet uh, and uh, the role of the one when we explain it and the real uh, becomes more clear. The diet in sign making uh, for example, in structuralist linguistic, this, uh, linguistics. Similarly, in computing, uh, we have binaries or dyads, right? But these binaries do not constitute a unit. They are not pairs that make sense. They do not amount to some meaning. They do not produce a dialectical unification of, I don't know, a, a synthesis of a third meaning. Their diets in a, in a radical way, uh, in the sense that they will always remain diets or binaries without any reconciliation, without any recreation of a third sense, without any dialectics there. What's there uh, within this diet? So mind you, the diet of the real and thought, the diet of the physical and uh, technology, the humanist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If we look at them uh, for, uh, in a, uh, from a structuralist uh, point of view, 
the point of view of structural linguistics. And let us point out that everything that we have uh, read in uh, post-structuralism uh, that derives from, I don't know, Foucault or Lacan or the others that are declared structuralists uh, is epistemologically grounded primarily in uh, Saussure's uh, uh, structuralist linguistics. So what happens there uh, uh, in, in these binaries, these pairs that are not really pairs in order to uh, produce science? What happens there is pure mechanics. Uh, one of the elements in the binary has to act as the real toward the other element in order to produce sense. Uh, if you remember this principles of Saussure, ar arbitrarity, relationality, etc., it's not a re relationality in the sense we have a relation and there is a certain mutu mutuality or whatever. Uh, there is no unity or whatsoever. The relation or relationality is simply for the al other element to be uh, uh, the border of the first one, to act actually as the real to uh, 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 to the other one and the other way around. I need two phonemes next to one another in order for the first phoneme to be pronounced uh, in a certain way and paired with this one mechanically to produce uh, a certain sound. And even the conditioning of how these things are paired is also physical because it, uh, uh, it it depends on a certain physiology that is uh, uh, presupposed in, in phonetics. Uh, so uh, these things are mechanical uh, in sign making. Uh, they are no doubt like that in computing, so in, in, uh, in artificial uh, languages. Uh, we have read about this in um, Turing or uh, 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 Paul Cockshott's in interpretation of Turing as uh, the first materialist mathematician. Uh, we could read uh, about the, this mechanicity, the relation between mechanicity uh, and organicity in computing and, and technology and in nature at, uh, in Hugh uh, uh, latest book. Um, therefore, uh, if the radical dyad is as we just elaborated, then the one element to the other serves as uh, this hemon, this uh, in German, this opposition to the first one in order to mechanically do the work of sign making, of trace making, of uh, yeah, language making of s uh, producing a, a scripture, a sign uh, that uh, th that's uh, language. Um, so, uh, at its core, it's uh, it's uh, there is this mechanicity and therefore materiality uh, at the core of uh, like uh, languages as well as in nature. As, uh, I mean, the, the other accounts, but I'll uh, resort here to uh, Yukhuis, uh, who demonstrates that we have this mechanicity that produces the organicity we find in uh, nature. So uh, that does not mean that thought and the real are the same because they have the same material uh, foundation or ontological foundation. They remain this radical diet and thought remain uh, 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 all the real, the other way around. The real remains radically foreclosed to thought, but thought still uh, seeks to relate to it, explain it, produce signs or a sign or sense of it. Um, just as it happens in uh, nature and computing, etc. So, if we are to do away with 
humanism and radicalize the uh, post-humanist argument, then we have to arrive at this completely uh, distinct categories of physicality and technicity without presupposing that uh, they constitute some organic unity or even if they do, the foundation of this organic uh, unity is this mechanical uh, process. So in this way, uh, how, how, how does, uh, I will conclude now. Uh, I'm assuming that it's implied how this is relevant for feminism, how this is uh, relevant for uh, gender issues or gender identities we discussed yesterday. Uh, it's relevant in the sense that it enables us to think about uh, physiology and nature uh, and materiality and of technology in more complex ways than what's philosophical spontaneity. Uh, so through uh, rigorous uh, categorization of the notions without uh, the philosophical uh, uh, spontaneous assumptions of the meaning of the potential unities. Therefore, language is relevant but physiology, uh, materiality, so also biology is relevant. There is no hierarchy between the two. And as I've explained in the book on the animals, wherever there is hierarchy, exploitation is implied. Uh, so that was... Uh, very, very uh, unexpected for me, reading of my own paper. I actually spoke rather than <laughs> wrote. And I don't know uh, if, it's, uh, if it's obvious directly how, how it is relevant to uh, feminism, but I hope it, uh, it shows uh, uh, how it's relevant for materialist discourse and Therefore, uh, materialism as an epistemological basis for feminism. Uh, and I don't know, I don't in fact need, uh, I'm not in fact uh, here to propose ways what to do with it in, in feminist terms. I mean, I have proposed uh, such feminist uh, uh, suggestions and elsewhere, not in this presentation. But I think that one can take this account I just gave and use it in all sorts of ways to think about gender as well. So I conclude here. All right. Uh, thanks, Katarina, so much for that uh, talk. Uh, we can now move um, into questions. So if there's anyone um, I guess we'll start online. Um, if there's anyone online that has any questions, just unmute your mic um, and we'll go from there. Maybe I can ask a question if no one has one. <laughs> I'm still, I'm digesting, so forgive me if it's a okay. bit, but thank you for the talk. Obviously, I'm gonna, I wanted to focus on um, this, uh, this third, third party view that you mentioned that I think is really interesting because it strikes me that it's not like, it's no, it also breaks away the dyad between the like, uh, the fight between the view from nowhere and the embodied view. It also does away with that, which is yeah. what I think is super interesting in a way that was my, my own uh, awkward and very unarticulate way to, to kind of deal with winter with her outer view. Mm -hmm. But the, there's like two, two things that I wanted to ask uh, was um, one, this is maybe an extension uh, and maybe you don't want to answer it because it doesn't really relate to the thematic of the of the summer school but is the role of mathematics within this uh, configuration that you're laying out between the real is the true and the true is the real sort of uh, you know as a kind of 
as a kind of epistemological methodology, like how does mathematics um, fit into that? And then, but the question that's more related to this third party view is the question of a perception. So, because if I understood it correctly in this third party view, it's almost like you are, you're not separating yourself. Uh, you are, you're, but you understand yourself implicated within and treat yourself as an object amongst other objects which I think is really important, uh, like to just say it in a more vulgar way, um, with our difficulty of dealing with ourselves as implicated in systems, right? Like how to, how to see ourselves in that, in that picture and, and what that does to modes of agency. Um, but then, yeah, so I was wondering, because that strikes me as a kind of a perceptual uh, issue mm -hmm. that one, or, or am I reading it wrong? Like, because one would have to be able to, have a concept for self understanding in order to see oneself as an object amongst many objects mm -hmm. or am i perverting your your yeah. your <laughs> no no uh, not at all i was just hesitating because the, that could be one of the uh, perspectives to look at it one could uh, apply you know lacanian method so the uh, you know the mirror stage so you're supposed to um, go through this form of subjectivization in order to uh, be able to project you know this image of yourself so um, it does have something to do with it but uh, okay let me start uh, from the beginning yeah you're quite right uh, actually Winters is quoted in uh, my book quite a lot, uh, but it's not um, uh, due to her influence. Uh, I think that this uh, understanding of the third party's perspective is uh, uh, positive. Maybe uh, it's also Marx influencing her when you look at her uh, epistemology, uh, because uh, it is, as you say, neither this subspecia aeternitatis positions, a God's a position of, you know, all-knowing position, uh, nor this, uh, you know, relativism of, uh, uh, which is typical of post-structuralism, but not only of post-structuralism, it can be, you know, a Kantian and post-Kantian uh, 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 position too, uh, as to the limits uh, of what we can perceive, interpret, etc. So um, it's uh, neither uh, nor, and uh, uh, what it is, in fact, and that's why I was hesitating uh, whether we can liken it to can't, although there is an element, you're correct, uh, that is approachable to Kant's uh, epistemology, but I would uh, keep things uh, simple and just say that uh, it's uh, simply derived from his, um, uh, so from Marx's uh, epistemology of the alienation. We, uh, the alienation is you know, inevitable. It's always already there. Uh, so this primary alienation that is ex uh, that is always already externalized uh, externalized in the forms uh, form of social relations uh, is uh, it's externalized and materialized in the forms uh, form of social uh, relations. Um, uh, so uh, uh, this uh, proceed, uh, th this primary alienation is something that uh, Marx never denies. He actually affirms, and uh, I, that's what I find most interesting in your project of uh, xenofeminism. That you depart from there, but uh, I kind of expected more Marx further on in your elaborations as a collective or individuals, but uh, did not witness much of it. Um, even though it departs from, from this understanding of Marx, which is completely correct. And I loved uh, that 
uh, my publication of the book back then, The Metaphysics of Socialism and your manifesto actually coincided with a completely similar uh, thesis about this uh, primary uh, alienation and the affirmation of this primary uh, alienation. What uh, uh, Marx opposes, in fact, is the, the denial, obfuscation of this primary alienation uh, through the era of uh, fetishization or reification. Uh, we must admit, uh, yesterday we spoke about that with uh, Conrad, we must admit that these abstractions are indeed abstractions. And in order to uh, uh, relate them to uh, uh, the material or the physical, we need not mask them as material. They are uh, abstractions, and we admit that. Um, nonetheless, uh, we have to uh, affirm as well that these abstractions uh, yield material results. I mean, social relations, what comes of them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is, really, is something very material, very uh, tangible, even when it's in the form of uh, the abstract, like, you know, relations themselves. Uh, and sometimes uh, literally, you know, physical, something that you can materially uh, uh, touch. Uh, and because our subjectivization, according, now this is my interpretation, uh, but uh, I think it's kind of just a mere inference of something that it's already there in Marxist text. I'm not over interpreting. So, um, uh, because of all of this, you know, put in this way, uh, in line with uh, Marxist original writings, it turns out that there is no other form of subjectivization for us than that of, you know, the initial alienation and uh, the transforming ourselves into kind of objects, you know, for the others, you know, you cannot even evade that. You are an object to the other in the social relations in which you're always already uh, embedded. So uh, this, uh, in fact, uh, position uh, seems uh, to Marx to both affirm uh, the materiality uh, or of social relations uh, is more in line with uh, his project of moving away uh, from philosophy. And it also discloses his problem with uh, subjectivity centered uh, thinking. Uh, he thinks that uh, the problem with philosophy is because it's organizing principle uh, of thought is subjectivity. Uh, so. Uh, you, uh, you know, of course, there is uh, the influence of Hegel there. The, of course, Marx is uh, a dialectician, but uh, by moving away from this organizing principle of thought and proposing something like this, the thing we just uh, discussed, he's fundamentally very different uh, from Hegel and um, I think that we should simply respect Marx's request that um, what he keeps from Hegel is the dialectical method. And let's not forget that uh, Marx's training, his uh, you know educational ba background is in Greek philosophy. And I think that he uses the term dialectics uh, closer to uh, the Greek understanding of uh, uh, the word, and therefore uh, uh, dialectics is uh, uh, relevant, but I, I mean, it, this is a footnote, but what makes him so different from Hegel is this treatment of uh, subjectivity. So I think I covered everything. And <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. Huge thank mess. You. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I do have to run, have a bit of a kind of family yeah. obligation, but thank you so much. Thank you for the comments on the questions. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if I understood correctly. I'm not sure. But um, if we have a river, for example, and we follow 
the expansion of, well, in this particular case, not philosophical, but political subjectivity of the river. Mm -hmm. As, for example, some women in Bosnia who were defending uh, the Khrushchitsa river, and they said, we are all Khrushchitsa in order to, mm -hmm. um, let's say, establish awareness of the river as having its own subjectivity. How does that differ to the expansion of, in this very specific case, particular, particularly political subjectivity in relation to what you said, going, doing away with subjectivity and putting ourselves as the object? So I don't know if those women were actually expanding the, the subjectivity of the river um, by saying we are all Khrushchev or they were putting themselves as the third position um, object, um, what you said? Yeah, it's a really good question. And in fact, a really good metaphor. Uh, I think that Khrushchev is uh, what keeps this community together. Uh, so in spite of it being part of the nature, not a subject, um, uh, being partly a metaphor, it's not only a metaphor. It's really in this material sense what uh, ties together the collectivity of these women. Uh, you know, uh, one of the ties that uh, keeps uh, the collective subjectivity uh, let's call it, it's not a forbidden word. <laughs> it's, uh, subjectivity is there and does exist, but um, we're looking at uh, how to, to think it and conceive it and uh, treat, it, uh, treat it as a phenomenon. I mean, of course there are subjects, you, you know, you're a thinking subject, I'm a thinking subject. Uh, uh, you can think from a subjective point of view as well. Uh, but uh, there is a problem there when it's the, the all legislating principle of thought and it's at odds with the materialist account uh, of it and uh, of uh, reality. So, uh, so it's a, epistemological difference, not difference in ontology. One does not uh, deny the existence of subjectivity, uh, subjectivities. Of course there are, there are, but in the examples you, you gave, uh, which is um, a political one, it's quite obvious that uh, these women uh, are equating themselves with the river and uh, through uh, which is not a subjectivity apparently, and through that uh, they reaffirm, they, they reconstitute uh, their social re relations. You know the uh, the phenomenon of social relations they establish, the collectivity they are. Um, so it's in fact a good example of uh, collective subjectivization and um, uh, yeah, collect collective subjectivization and pronunciation of this subjectivization through something which is not at all uh, a subjectivity and cannot be a subject or a subjectivity. It's like parallaxing the, the whole sub subjectivity discussion. So uh, in fact, it's a very good illustration of what I and Patricia just discussed at the end. I don't know if this is clear. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? And we'll open it up um, uh, to the people who are physically uh, participating as well. The others can join in later from the online panel if they wish. Uh, we'll give the floor now to Branislava because she has questions. And then if the others have questions, they may, Zach, they may be raising hands in this uh, bar with the list of participants. You can check there. Yeah, so I, I, I think I'll be short. I was just curious, what would you say about the idea? There is a, a British Marxist professor called, called uh, Sean Sire. And mm -hmm. I read his paper about 
he has the idea of the subject as historical emergence in Marx. In Marx. So mm -hmm. unlike um, he Hegelian idea of subject as, as some um, um, entity and uh, at the outset of the history, mm -hmm. uh, for Marx there is no there is no such such thing at the outset. There is no plan, pre-plan, mm -hmm. but the subject as emergent, historical emergence. So it was mm -hmm. this metaphysical uh, narrative, mm -hmm. but like. Mm -hmm. Would you accept this idea, subject as emergence, and then it develops. At some point, uh, there is a qualitative mm -hmm. uh, change, qualitative mm -hmm. difference, and then it starts to develop through history, but there mm -hmm. is no plan at the outset. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it's hard. Is it yeah, yeah, yeah. or it's not a physical narrative? It's, it's hard to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand. There is no this preconceived, I don't know, or... I, Hegelian, it's Hegelian. It's Hegelian, Hegelian yeah. yeah. Subjectivity is somewhere out there, not in the material world, uh, you know, uh, predating the yes. material reality and then shaping it. Uh, but uh, quite Logistic. the opposite. It's the product of uh, material or historical processes. That sounds like a mat the materialist and Marx yes. and account of, this word, uh, I emergent. would agree. Yeah. Would agree yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then it's like, is it is it philosophy or it's not philosophy? Because it, it, it emerges as uh, philosophy. Uh, uh, this, uh, we are all subjects. Uh, uh, the problem with philosophy and non-philosophy and Marx's proposal to um, exit philosophy is how we treat this reality of subjectivity. We do not uh, deny that it exists, that, that there are subjectivities. We all are subjectivities. Uh, it's, a, a, it's just a, a proposition to look at uh, when we discuss scientifically uh, how subjectivities relate to one another. When we look at our own subjectivity, etc., if we are materialists, we should posit ourselves as the objects of uh, discussion, and not just as the object of discussion, but also presuppose that the subjectivity was born from these objective relations. Uh, there is no subjectivity outside of, uh, of these objective relations that are the social uh, mm -hmm. relations. Yeah, yeah. Something, so, something like that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. That was a good comment. All right. Um, are there any other questions? I'd like to ask. Oh, oh. sorry. I'd like to ask uh, <laughs> since mm -hmm. I'm uh, seeing that. Uh, that uh, uh, that no one others um, having a question. Okay, I'm interested in, in this um, uh, non-philosophical treating of the diet, which is uh, uh, one of the central uh, uh, points of your uh, work, right? Yeah. So uh, the point you said is uh, that uh, there's no unification, right? And there's no uh, kind of in this uh, unilateral determination from the real in the last instance, right? There's no kind of a melting of the one, uh, of the binary uh, kind of, you know, right. yeah. no unity and no kind of melting of the binary, so to say. Right. So you kind of, you leave them in a suspension, if I'm right, uh, or, uh, and uh, it then, uh, so mm -hmm. there then comes your, uh, or uh, then this can be connected to you, who is uh, kind of mechanics that he, mm -hmm. That you uh, think that can be recognized, uh, right, in computational sciences, in uh, language, in nature, even. So, uh, yeah, just this uh, uh, treating of the bi uh, of the binary. If you can kind of um, re repeat that part. Uh, okay. I I guess you are familiar with uh, uh, Laurel's uh, notion of the diet. Yeah, yeah, I, I was reading him, so should be. So you are interested in how I uh, um, uh, re uh, rapproached, uh, brought closer Laurel's uh, account to Hui, to structuralist linguistics, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, structuralist linguistics uh, helped me uh, interpret the uh, the diet in a, a 
more productive uh, way let's uh, put it that way what laurel uh, gives us are certain epistemological tools but we're supposed to do something with them uh, when uh, we apply those tools to interpreting the human as the non-human uh, we arrive uh, arrive at the problem of language for example and we arrive at the uh, the problem of uh, the real as the physical. So other uh, sciences or no, uh, uh, knowledges, or uh, uh, not just sciences, also knowledges or concepts that uh, derive from philosophy have to be brought into the disco discussion in order to give a Laruelian account of what the human is so far as the non-human uh, uh, or the radical diet is, and uh, uh, because uh, Laurel's categories are rather ster sterile, so uh, I resorted to uh, Saussure's uh, interpretation of language uh, and how science relate to one another in the, the production of uh, signification in order to demonstrate that, that something so mechanical as uh, the relation between the two elements in the binary and then the binary with other binaries, you know, uh, producing ternaries, etc. Oh, I forgot to uh, respond to Patricia about mathematics. mathematics uh, <laughs> now I remember, but uh, uh, never mind. Uh, I'll uh, make a footnote uh, to that. Uh, so, um uh, the way they uh, 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 they are posited toward one another and this way is quite mechanical uh, mm -hmm. nonetheless produces something very organic something that feels so organic and in fact constitutes an automaton which is the language in the sense of language all languages in the generic sense let's Put it in Laurelian terms, that would be called the generic language or uh, le langage. Uh, so every language, all languages are produced, if uh, we look at them, and I do look at them through this uh, uh, Saussurean glass, uh, uh, they're all created in this very material, uh, coarse materiality, uh, even uh, very material, mechanical way. Yet again, they produce something that uh, not just feels, uh, but institutes itself as something uh, super organic and uh, uh, yeah, as organic, uh, which is, uh, for example, the automaton of uh, language, of sign making. Uh, uh, so there is nothing more automatic and uh, organic at the same time. Uh, and yet mechanical at its origin, or it's not even the origin, this thing, these things are parallel, then language. So we can apply the same reasoning of this uh, radical diet, the human, which we will call the non-human is, in order to demonstrate that in spite of this unsurmountable grounding, grounding alienation, between sign making and the physical and their quasi mechanical relation to one another as if miming the binary in Saussure um, with this, the, you know, this production of the sign. Uh, uh, in spite of this uh, mechanicity between the two elements of the radical diet, they still produce something that feels like a, a, an organic unity. Uh, and that's done through uh, the treatment of something that we will call um, um, stochastic uh, um, uh, atomism. No, no, no. Let's let's uh, put it uh, put that away. You know, I'm referring to you know uh, the incident uh, accidents. Uh, let's not go into all the yeah. time, we'll, we'll lose too much uh, time. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, how uh, contingency is treated. Recursivity goes back to the contingent, to what makes no sense, and finds a way to integrate it. So here yeah. I find uh, Hui very uh, useful. He yeah. explains how come the purely mechanical uh, uh, ends up feeling, presenting itself, manifesting itself as organic. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But yeah, I understand. It's uh, you're treating it, and it's staying a radical diet, and that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, not uh, so. You're uh, you're explaining that in the difference uh, between your project and Larvelian project, and uh, I don't know uh, transhumanism and that. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay.